here it is get your trading post in Maine cross two state lines to get here looking for black powder for my musket and I think I'm gonna find it let me get in there and I'll let you know what I find okay it worked now it's interesting for me to learn along the way here I've been saying all along that I needed a license to carry to buy black powder. That is true in the state of Massachusetts. So for several months I've been waiting to acquire black powder and even begin work on my musket because there's really no reason to have it all set if I can't even buy the black powder. So I got my license to carry. I finished my musket as you've seen. I have gone through all the steps and now it's time to buy the black powder. Well, it turns out I can't find anyone in Massachusetts who will sell it to me because they don't carry it. Uh, I, I drove around to a couple of Cabela's uh, to ask them because the Cabela's national website says that they have black powder of the kind that I'm looking for. That's another thing I had to learn very quickly about what is it that I'm really looking for. So I show up in Cabela's and I say, gentlemen, can you help me? figure out what black powder I'm supposed to get and they have all kinds of black powder but they're designed for modern black powder weapons not my old replica musket which requires a different kind of black powder basically the kind that they really would have had during the Revolutionary War uh, more than 200 years ago so it's interesting everyone I asked I'd say okay well where would I get that one word kittery Kittery is a town in Maine. It's right over the border. In fact, right now I'm driving away from it over the bridge that takes me back into New Hampshire. So I go to Kittery. Well, I, I don't want to drive to Maine just to buy black powder if it's more available. And I figure New Hampshire's the live free or die state. People up there love guns. So I'll just go up there and I call around at specialty gun shops after specialty gun shop. Nope, don't carry it. All right, who should I contact? Try Kittery. Now what's funny is, I didn't know what that meant, but everyone just said one word, like Kittery. Well, I know that's a town in Maine, fine. I didn't know that they meant Kittery Trading Post, or KTP, which of course is a specialty, you know, hunting supply kind of store. It's got all the flannel you could possibly want. It's a great store. I really should have spent hours there and picked up some clothing. I mean, you can tell I wore some flannel for the occasion, but uh, <laughs> this was really, really quite an adventure for me to go in there and I didn't bring my camera in there of course because that's that's not my right uh, to to uh, film inside a commercial establishment without their permission um, but I'll tell you what I saw in there I saw every manner of specific tool for different kinds of things from obviously archery airsoft uh, BB guns I saw an old Daisy BB gun just like the one I had when I was a kid and that made me a little bit nostalgic um, but, uh, and of course, ammunition and rifles and pistols and all kinds of, of weapons in there. Um, and then, of course, a very, very small section dedicated to muzzle-loading black powder weapons, including tools for cleaning and uh, measuring out black powder and all these things. Well, the good news is I've been doing my research, and uh, as you'll see in this video, I, I actually know what I need to do with the black powder that I've now acquired. But just come back to my original point, the reason I couldn't um, get black powder in Massachusetts until I got my license to carry and then ironically can't find any black powder in Massachusetts anyway. And to be honest, there's probably a place way out in Western Mass where I could buy it, but Maine is closer to me. This is hard for people out West to understand. I grew up out West and you have to drive, uh, you know, sometimes depending on where you are, six hours in a single direction to cross a state line. Uh, here, I crossed through New Hampshire on my way to Maine and got to Maine in about an hour and 15 minutes. So that's faster than driving west across across uh, Massachusetts. So anyway, I couldn't find in Eastern Mass, I couldn't find anyone that could sell me black powder with my license to carry. I go to Kittery, cross state lines, and I don't need a license to carry to buy black powder in the state of Maine. Probably don't need it in, in uh, New Hampshire either, but no one will sell it to me in New Hampshire because they just don't carry it. So this is a very specialized kind of powder. People who use black powder weapons for hunting today, which is a thing, uh, they, they're not using um, muzzle-loading brown bass replicas to do hunting. Um, and if they are, they go to Kittery to buy their black powder and all their equipment. So I'll stop now, and next time you see me, it will be making cartridges 
which are those paper wads that I was telling you about that have the, uh, the black powder that I just bought in the, um, in the cartridge and the wad. And I'm learning something amazing. The ball is in the cartridge as well. Duh. Duh. <laughs> there is nothing in anything I have read on the historian side, not the weaponry side, but the historian side, about these Revolutionary War events where anyone ever explained that the ball is packed into the cartridge. Makes so much sense. I kept wondering, how did the ball not roll out? And I kept hearing, reading historical accounts about balls that do roll out. I was like, okay, that must be a problem. Turns out it's not a problem if you do it right. And I can explain how to do it right. And I'll talk about when people don't do it right and why that might be a normal thing. Uh, because if you're just hunting for deer out there in the woods and you're sitting down uh, next to a bush waiting for the deer to walk into a clearing, you don't actually need to pack a cartridge and you don't actually need to have all, you can just use a powder horn and a couple of shot instead of a single ball, you can use a couple of different. So anyway, all of those things I'm learning. This is a fascinating journey. I'll have a whole other commentary about learning about things um, and how just invigorating it is to learn stuff that's new to me, old to a very small number of people. Very, very few people know these things, and I'm really grateful to the people who still know them and are sharing them, and I'll credit some of them later. Thanks. Welcome back. Uh, before I jump into today's preparation for my musket, uh, let me just share with you something that I encountered since our last visit. a visit. Here it comes. I just happened to be in Puerto Rico, uh, San Juan, and came across, while well, in the Castillo de uh, San Cristobal, which is the big fortress that overlooks the city, or one end of the big fortress that overlooks the city, El Morro, the, uh, I found a bunch of muskets. I don't know, you know, to what extent these are actually historic. Um, they sure don't look brand new and they're not taking super good care of them. I'm a little worried about the flintlocks uh, here and the uh, frizzins, they all seem to be rusting. I think it would be interesting um, to have this job here where, you're, where your responsibility would be to look after uh, the authenticity of the setting, you know, the clothing, the bedrolls, the everything here to represent what life would have been like. But I'd be very interested to find out whether they ever do any displays of firing cannon or these muskets. Found out out there actually that um, Santa Barbara, uh, Saint Barbara, is actually the patron saint of artillerymen because she is believed to protect people from fire and lightning. And so when they started using gunpowder widely in the 1300s, in Spain at least, and I don't know where else, they in what became Spain, they started using Barbara as the protector. Um, so there'd be little statuettes of Santa Barbara, Barbara um, in all of these areas where there was a lot of gunpowder being stored, which of course all around here they would have stored lots of gunpowder. Uh, so I didn't know that as a musketman I'm going to have my own patron saint, which I'm not making light of that. I'm not a, not a Catholic, so maybe I shouldn't uh, seem to make light of that. Hello and welcome back. I'm James McQuibby and I'm preparing to fire my period replica musket. Along the way I've shared with you the history of the musket itself. Uh, today I'm going to update you since we last spoke when I was driving home from Maine where I had to drive to acquire black powder. The right black powder for this kind of primitive musket. Primitive is a term they use to describe uh, weapons that basically don't qualify as modern weapons by state law in Massachusetts and other states. So I have my primitive weapon here. I have my primitive powder because there are lots of kinds of powder for other types of powder weapons, but for primitive weapons you got to use a particular type. And this week I was able to get in the mail my paper cartridge kit. You might remember I explained that the term we use today for shotgun shells or is cartridge and those cartridges that name comes from these these paper cartridges which I will make during this video I haven't opened it yet I haven't started yet um, this particular kit comes with all the materials that I need to make uh, it's a piece of paper the appropriate weight and combustibility 
that gets rolled around a ball, packed with powder, tied up with twine, um, and then a well-prepared militiaman. So unlike someone who might be hunting in 1775 for deer, they might actually have a powder horn and take their musket and pour the powder using a measuring device because you absolutely had to measure. You couldn't just eyeball it. Use a measuring device, pour the powder down the muzzle, uh, pack a ball, or maybe even a couple of small balls in there. That's the, the precursor to today's shotguns. It's multiple balls. Um, and that would take a while. You had to take it out, do it all, and pack it in. And then you would need some kind of wadding in there to keep the ball from rolling or the balls from rolling out. All of that. That's for hunting, that's fine, but when you're in a combat situation in 1775, which is what happened here in Massachusetts between the British regulars and the colonial um, rebels, call them, sure, uh, the colonial militia um, and the militiamen, they all came prepared with cartridges. Now, cartridges, as I said, piece of paper, as you'll see, powder rolled up inside, stuffed with a ball at one end, tied to, to, uh, twine to tie it off, so that the soldier can reach down to their, to their uh, pack. And you remember hearing a, a phrase perhaps about keep your powder dry. Well, one of the references that that applies to is you basically have this little, this little tiny, tiny suitcase on your side that has maybe a block of wood in it with some holes bored in. And into each one you've dropped, you know, maybe there's 20 holes, you've dropped 20 cartridges. So that gives you 20 refires off of just what you have on you. And hopefully that's enough to manage any particular skirmish. Um, so you would reach down, pull that out, bite off the top, pour the powder down the front of the muzzle, um, and then take that paper and ball and stuff it in using the rod that you can't see here, um, and pack that in so that the combination of the wad and the ball stay in tight. That paper serves as the wad in that case. So that's what's going to happen here. You would have maybe a separate powder supply or you would have poured a little bit of that powder into the musket pan and close the frizzin on the on the powder to keep it in place. Um, and that allows you to um, have the powder that you need to ignite with the flint, striking the frizzin, which then creates the spark that goes inside, ignites the powder, as I think I've told you a couple of times now. But I have to keep reciting it for myself. I've never done it. I've only ever seen it in videos or you know reenactments that I've seen from a distance. So uh, working my way to getting to know actually how to do this, and that will be crucial today. Along the way, I'm going to, uh, you know, as I do this in voiceover mode, I'll tell you a little bit more about the process of getting my license to carry in the state of Massachusetts, which ironically I don't need for this musket and didn't need to buy this powder because I had to cross state lines to buy the powder. You can own the powder in the state of Massachusetts, you just can't buy it in the state of Massachusetts without a license to carry. So all of that, I didn't actually need a license to carry. But just before I jump into the voiceover mode and, and remind you about the process and what I learned along the way, I'll just show you that in order to get this certificate of, certificate of completion that certifies you as live fire, having completed all the required coursework and training curriculum for the Massachusetts pistol license, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Class A license to carry. I've got a signature from my instructor and a certification stamp there. Um, he's obviously certified with the state to be a, a, an instructor. I'll just show you this. I kept it. I didn't need to keep it. In some towns, you historically have had to show that you could demonstrate your ability to fire live fire. These are 22, um, 22 ammunition rounds. Um, not 22 as in the number that I fired, but 22 as in the caliber of the weapons that we were firing. Two different types of handguns. They had us fire a revolver, and they had us fire a... Um, just a pistol, uh, revolver meaning it has chambers that revolve, and pistol meaning it's just a loading from underneath the kind you see in the movies maybe with a cartridge that pops out. 22 caliber, both of them. Showing that to you uh, because it was a very interesting process, I'll talk about it some more as I'm doing the video, but hey, let's jump into what we came here for, which is to use my give credit where credit's due, Jefferson Arsenal paper cartridge kit so that I can have not only confidence that I'm doing it right, but also the correct uh, materials so that I don't blow up my musket when I try to go fire it, because that can happen if you do it wrong. All right, let's jump in.